Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Alrighty. What's up, guys? Um, McJavin here, back with another reaction video. If you are new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I love to learn about history through YouTube recommendations, which you guys have been amazing at so far. Love for you to join the community, subscribe, like, whatever. Join the Discord. I highly recommend it. I think I can show it. But um, there's a lot of different categories. Great people in there. We're all really nice. Um, it's more just the casual. But anyways, love to have you. Talk, don't talk. You know, that's up to you. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Love for you to join. It makes it easier for me to interact with you and see your recommendations as well. We still got Winston with us right here. He's hanging out uh, for the next video as well. Going to do Caesar. Let's get right into it. The last episode. Am I on four or five? I'm on five. Um, last video, um, there was there's touched on the Crimean War. Um, a lot of uh, obviously the empire expanding and talked about like the Russian Enlightenment period, like the late 1800s. Um, lots of, a lot of Russian composers and poets, philosopher, philosophers. And uh, so, yeah, let's let's keep it going. I recommend you watch parts one through five or one through four. Make it easier for you to understand this episode. Of course, that is up to you. Let's go. In 1881, Hope you're all doing Russian good. Emperor Alexander II was assassinated by left-wing terrorists in St. Petersburg. Today, the place where he was fatally wounded is marked by the magnificent Church of the Saviour on spilled blood. Alexander II had been a reformer, hailed as the liberator for freeing Russia's serfs. But his son and successor Alexander III believed his father's reforms had unleashed dangerous forces within Russia that ultimately led to his death. Sorry if I have sauce on my face. I just had lunch. As emperor, he publicly vowed to reassert autocratic rule, declaring that, in the midst of our great grief, the voice of God orders us to undertake courageously the task of ruling with faith in the strength and rightness of autocratic power. secret police, the so-called Okranka, was ordered to infiltrate Russia's many revolutionary groups. Those found guilty of plotting against the government were hanged or sent into internal exile in Siberia. Is that like the early KGB? Alexander III was a pious man who supported the Orthodox Church and the assertion of a strong Russian national identity. Russia's Jews became victims of this policy. They'd already been targeted in murderous race riots known as pogroms, after false rumors were spread that they were responsible for the assassination of the emperor. Now, the government expelled 20,000 Jews from Moscow, and many who could began to leave the country. Over the next 40 years, around 2 million Jews would leave Russia, most bound for the USA. Don't go to Germany. Concerned by the growing power of Germany, Russia signed an alliance with France, both sides promising military aid if the other was attacked. Sergei Vita was appointed Russia's new Minister of Finance. His reforms helped to modernize the Russian economy and encourage foreign investment, particularly from its new ally, France. French loans helped Russia to develop its industry and infrastructure. Work began on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Completed in 1916, it remains the world's longest railway line, running 5,772 miles from Moscow to Vladivostok. Alexander III was succeeded by his son, Nicholas II. 
His coronation was marred by tragedy. He looks just like King George the third, fifth. When four. I know they're related. His coronation was marred by tragedy when 1,400 people were crushed to death at an open-air celebration in Moscow. China granted Russia the right to build a naval base at Port Arthur. Learned about Port Arthur in the uh, Russo-Japanese War. Uh, I think it was kings and generals. When China faced a major revolt known as the Boxer Rebellion, Russia moved troops into Manchuria under the pretext of defending Port Arthur from the rebels. This brought Russia into conflict with Japan. I feel like I haven't paused too much compared to me in the past, so I'm going to ask a question here. How powerful, uh, just because of the sheer distance between your capital, just how powerful of an, of an army did they have around Manchuria, Vladivostok, you know, just far, far eastern Russia. And uh, I'm assuming they didn't have many tr troops in the in the middle, like along the Mongolian, Kazakhstani border. But I'm just curious, like, just how many troops did they have over here? This brought Russia into conflict with hiccup. Japan, who also had designs over Manchuria and Korea. The Japanese made a surprise attack on Port Arthur, then defeated the Russian army at the giant Battle of Mukden. Russia's Baltic fleet, meanwhile, had sailed halfway around the world to reach the Pacific, where it was immediately annihilated at the Battle of Tsushima. From the Kings and Generals video, I, I just remember the Russian sailors weren't great to start with. I'm not saying all of them. But to just go that long, huge journey around there, just to, for the Japanese to be waiting for right when they show up. Imagine just traveling that all that way just to be, oh, we're almost there. Boom, 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 boom. And they know you're tired and weary from traveling. And uh, the Japanese really defeated them there. To reach the Pacific, where it was immediately annihilated at the Battle of Tsushima. Russia was left with no option but to sign a humiliating peace, brokered by U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy. Meanwhile, the Tsar faced another crisis much closer to home. In St. Petersburg, a strike by steel workers had escalated, and plans were made for a mass demonstration. Tens of thousands of protesters marched to the Winter Palace to present a petition to the Tsar, asking for better workers' rights and more political freedom. But instead, troops opened fire on the crowds, killing more than 100. Bloody Sunday, as it became known, led to more strikes and unrest across the country. The crew of the battleship Potemkin mutinied killing their officers and taking control of the ship. What? To defuse the crisis, Nicholas II reluctantly issued the October Manifesto, drafted under the supervision of Sergei Vita. It promised an elected assembly and new political rights, including freedom of speech, and was welcomed by most moderates. Russia's first constitution was drafted the next year. For the first time, the Tsar would share power with an elected assembly, the State Duma, though the Tsar had the right to veto its legislation and dissolve it at any time. Sergei Vita finally lost the Tsar's confidence and was dismissed. The Tsar's new prime minister, Stolypin, introduced land reforms to help the peasants. While dealing severely with Russia's would-be revolutionaries, so much so that the hangman's noose got a new nickname, Stolypin's Necktie. But having survived several attempts on his life, Stolypin was shot and killed by an assassin at several attempts on... But having survived several attempts on...
But having survived several attempts on his life, Stolypin was shot and killed by an assassin at the Kiev Opera House. Meanwhile, Grigory Rasputin, a Siberian faith healer, had joined the imperial family's inner circle. Thanks to his unique ability to ease the suffering of the Tsar's hemophiliac son, Alexei. Despite sporadic acts of terrorism, Russia now had the fastest growing economy in Europe. Agricultural and industrial output were on the rise. Most ordinary Russians remained loyal to the Tsar and his family. Russia's future seemed bright. In 1914, in Sarajevo, a Slav national... Sorry, wow, I know. Look how big Russia is. In 19... So Russia's borders now are kind of like... Like here. Something like that. But just, they have all down. 1914, in... I wonder what the height of their territorial expansion was. In 1914, I missed it. in Sorry. Sarajevo, a Slav nationalist assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, sparking a European crisis. When Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Emperor Nicholas ordered the Russian army to mobilize, to show his support for a fellow Slav nation. Austria-Hungary's ally, Germany, saw Russian mobilization as a threat and declared war. Dominoes. Europe's network of alliances came into effect, and soon all the major powers were marching to war. World War I had begun. Russia experienced a wave of patriotic fervor. The capital, St. Petersburg, was even renamed Petrograd to sound less German. An early Russian advance into East Prussia. So Lenin comes in soon, right? I'm not sure until he's a bit later, like 1917. Ended with heavy defeats. An early Russian advance into East Prussia ended with heavy defeats at Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes. There was greater success against Austria-Hungary, but that too came at a high price. Uh, sorry, but what do you guys think down in the comments? Was Germany the greatest power in Europe at this time? I, I know you can kind of say Great Britain because of all of their colonies and resources, but just in terms of on the continent of Europe having a standing army in Europe, was Germany the clear favorite just on an individual country level? Austria Hungary, but that too came at a high price. Russian losses forced the army to make a general retreat in 1915. In 1916, Russia's Brusilov offensive against Austro Hungarian forces was one of the most successful Allied attacks of the war. But losses were so heavy that the Russian army was unable to launch any more major operations. In Petrograd, Rasputin, whose alleged influence over the Tsar's family was despised by certain Russian aristocrats, was murdered, possibly with the help of British agents. Lenin? The war put intolerable strains on Russia. At the front, losses were enormous, while in the cities, economic mismanagement led to rising prices and food shortages. In Petrograd, the workers' frustration led to strikes and demonstrations. Troops ordered to disperse the crowds refused and joined the protesters instead. The government had lost control of the capital. On board the Imperial train at Puskov, Lenin, senior politicians and generals told the Emperor Damn it. he train at Puskov. Senior politicians and generals told the Emperor he must abdicate, or Russia would descend into anarchy 
and lose the war. Get out of there. Nicholas accepted their advice and renounced the throne in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael, who effectively declined the offer. 400. I'm good, man. I, I don't want to get my head. Year, who effectively declined the offer. 400 years of Romanov rule were at an end. Russia was now a republic. A provisional government took power, but could not halt Russia's slide into economic and military chaos. Workers, soldiers and peasants elected their own councils, known as Soviets. The Petrograd Soviet was so powerful, it was effectively a rival government, especially as discontent with the provisional government continued to grow. The Bolsheviks, under Vladimir Lenin, attracted growing support with their radical proposals for an immediate end to the war, the redistribution of land, and transfer of power to the Soviets. In Commies! No, I'm just kidding, guys. October, they to the Soviets. In October, they launched a coup masterminded by Leon Trotsky. Bolshevik Red Guards stormed the Winter Palace, where the provisional government met, and arrested its members. Lenin and the Bolsheviks were now in charge. I feel like this is the scariest part of any revolution. I'm not saying there wasn't reason to rise up against monarchs when people are suffering and they're living lavishly, but right now seems to be the most terrifying part of any revolution right after the revolution succeeds russia had been thrown upon a bold and dangerous course it, sorry just because now they're going to be looking for anyone who is trying to keep them from getting to power russia had been thrown upon a bold and dangerous course under a marxist inspired revolutionary party it would now seek to create the world's first communist state. But first, it would have to survive the chaos and slaughter of one of history's bloodiest civil wars. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you to the Patreons. Thank you, Epic History, who's apparently one guy, by the way, not other than the narrator. Which is crazy. Such a good job. Um, I'm going to be back soon with the next part. Uh, there's a next, next part, I believe. I think there are six parts. Let me just make sure real quick. Right here. Oh, there are seven. So, part five, and then there is the Russian Revolution. Okay, so I have one more, because parts one through five would be the five I just saw, and then the next episode, the Revolution. I will check that out for sure. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I really pay attention now to, you know, when I get a bad dislike ratio, to I got to go back, see what I did wrong, fix it. It's part of growing as a channel. Sometimes dislikes help as much or more than likes do, because... Uh, you know, it makes you want to improve. Um, so thanks, guys, again for watching. I'll be back with another video soon. See you guys. Hope you're doing well. Remember, emotions are a fickle thing. If you're not doing good, I hope you're good soon. See you guys.